Hey everybody, Sean Sewell from GameMed.com podcast. Very excited to have my friend Eric Frohart, retired Navy SEAL, strong first, just an ultimately awesome, awesome man on the show. Eric, good to have you. Thanks, buddy. Good to be here. Been a while. It has been a while. Speaking of wild, last time we saw each other, we were out on a hike, right? Yeah. We rucking. Yeah. Uh, that was a uh, rucking. Rucking. Uh, you were training for bow hunting season, and yep. I think you had 50 plus pounds in your backpack. Yeah. And you're, we're talking about the oxygen advantage and breathing through your nose and all these helpful fitness tips. I, I went home and brain dumped that night, and I got the book and uh, all the stuff. You're just a wealth of fitness and health knowledge. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, well, you, you're too kind. I wouldn't consider myself a wealth of, a wealth of knowledge on anything. Well, um, I always enjoy hanging out with you and doing fun, fun stuff. Um, let's talk about your background. So we're both Midwest folk. I grew up in Nebraska, Omaha, like your wife. All um, right. Yeah, yeah. And you're from Iowa. So I'm from Iowa. My wife's from actually from near Omaha in uh, Ginger Cove. Oh, I don't even know that. It's such a small <laughs> place. Yeah, it's out by Valley. And my... Uh, I have um, my brother, one of my brothers, and my sister live in Omaha now. So we know, we know Omaha pretty well. Nice. The zoo, the best zoo in the nation. Such awesome. <laughs> so you grew up in, in Iowa on a farm? Yeah. That yeah, that's correct. Wow. On a, on a hog farm. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so what, what's that like? I mean, growing up in the Midwest, I know our values are like nice uh, salty earth people, but growing up literally on a hog farm, that's got to be entirely different. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, you know, not fun at the time. It's, uh, you know, I'd say it's a great, <laughs> it's a great upbringing and it's a mm-hmm. great thing to kind of be from, uh, mm-hmm. man, it's just really hard work. And, <laughs> uh, you know, now less than it was then because more of it's, uh, kind of automated and mm-hmm. specialized. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, back then it was pretty hard work, uh, you know, moving hogs, feeding hogs, you know, taking care of them. Uh, and the weather, you know, a lot of them were outside back then. And, you know, the weather in Iowa, if people don't realize it's pretty, uh, it's pretty severe. You know, it can get above 100 mm-hmm. or up to 110 with that humidity and oh yeah, 50 below or colder uh, with the wind chill. So, you know. Half the time, you're just trying to keep hogs alive. Yeah, well, that's a good point, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, growing up in Omaha, humidity is much higher because you get the Missouri, you get the Platte River, and yeah, yeah, when it's cold, it sticks to your bones. When it's hot, it's demoralizing. You, there is no, like here in Colorado, when it's hot, if I go sit in the shade, mm-hmm. it's cool. Yeah. The shade, the shade in the Midwest, it just it doesn't work. It doesn't work, and there's bugs, so many bugs. Yeah. Yeah. We have it really, really moderate here in Colorado. Like we, so, this is such so a, chill. <laughs> yeah. Our weather patterns, they're, they can be all on the same day and it's, they're all easily manageable. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nothing. Nothing. Well, so growing up in Iowa, um, what led you, um, I hope we talk quite a bit about this because this is really short. Sure. Um, what intrigued you about serving and how do yeah. you Right. Now I've done, I've done a bunch of stuff. Obviously nothing's quite as cool as being a, you know, besides being a husband and a father, um, you know, all the other jobs that I've had are not, uh, they're not quite as cool as, you know, that time when I was in the military. So, uh, I was in the military for, you know, almost 12 years before getting medically, medically retired, uh, had gotten, gotten hurt in combat and then, uh, had some, nagging injuries from over a decade of kind of you know going to war and then the navy discovered that i had a kind of medical condition that kind of just that basically disqualified me from serving so just months before i don't know it would have been my eighth deployment or something like that uh i was told by the bureau of navy medicine uh you can no longer um deploy i was uh in their words, unfit for duty. And oh. uh, being a fitness guy, obviously, hearing the words unfit for duty drove me wild. Uh, earlier uh, in 2008, after a deployment, I went and climbed Denali. And then mm-hmm. in 2009, I climbed Aconcagua. 
And these are, you know, two of the highest, well, highest mountain in North America, highest mountain in South America, mm -hmm. uh, pretty brutal, you know, not, not by mountaineering standards, by mountaineering standards, probably quite easy. But for most people, those are brutal, you know, 15 to 20 day events. So I considered myself relatively fit. Um, <laughs> More anyway, <laughs> more, and then all of a sudden, you know, I couldn't apply. So back to how it started for, you know, almost 12 years, I was a, a Navy SEAL. And uh, I grew up on a hog farm in Iowa, went to uh, football was my passion when I, you know, junior high through high school. Um, really felt that uh, that was my calling. Went to college for a year to play football realized uh, that God had blessed me in other ways, one of which was not to be a, you know, an inside linebacker. So um, on a bet, on a bet that I couldn't become a Navy SEAL, uh, I joined the Navy. And uh, I actually, story. yeah, yeah. And I actually, um, we were watching a movie in a dorm room. Uh, I had walked in and they were watching this movie about the SEALs and I just, a light bulb went on and uh, I stood up and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to join the Navy and become a SEAL. And people in the room laughed at me and uh, I said, I, I will, I guarantee it. And uh, anyway, um, still there. Yep. I had a, someone tried calling me. So I said, I'll make it. I guarantee it. And uh, I, I bet somebody in a dorm room, uh, in my freshman year of college, and I, I enlisted the next day. Um, wow. Yeah, I did finish that year of college. Uh, I told my parents that I was going to drop out of college and I was going to become a, a Navy SEAL. And you can imagine how many, you know, how parents would be excited uh, of the prospect of your, you know, your oldest kid dropping out of college to join the military. Um, yeah. Anyway, ended up being uh, the right call. So yeah, that, that kind of, that kind of started it. And then, um, you know, it was quite a shock for me having never, A, never seen the ocean, uh, and B, never gotten on an airplane. Uh, you Whoa. know, our, va our vacations were to Omaha, you know, your hometown. <laughs> so <laughs> quite we had a, a pretty, uh, <laughs> we had a pretty sheltered thing, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but I want to, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't change it. Um, I joined the Navy, uh, ended up staying in for 12 years, doing a bunch of deployments, having lots of fun, serving my country. And, uh, you know, it all worked out. Um, so joined the Navy, uh, went to boot camp, another school. Back then you had to take um, some other form of training before you went to SEAL training because it, it, was, it was a fallback option for when you didn't make it through BUDS. So mm -hmm. I did that. And then I reported to BUDS and uh, made it through BUDS training first time. Uh, went to jump school. And uh, then for six months, you're kind of a probationary, you know, SEAL. You're not really a SEAL yet. You're on probation. During that time, you go through a bunch of other training. And at the end of that probationary period, um, you take this kind of test and they give you your trident if you pass. So. And that Your took first try <laughs> that took, yeah, it was very interesting having not, you know, not seen the ocean, never, yeah. never dove, not even in a pool. Um, you, I think that you didn't enjoy water and you went to become a Navy SEAL. Well, I mean, I swam in pools, but I never was like a, I never had gone scuba diving. Sure. Right? sure. Or, you know, I water sco skied and inner tubed, but I wasn't like <laughs> recreational. Sure, I wasn't a waterman by any yeah. stretch. And yeah. then, so I, I, you know, I always had a steep learning curve. Um, I think the third or maybe the fourth time I got on an airplane in my life, uh, I was wearing a parachute. So, you know, it was always, uh, it was always a, I guess, steep learning curve is the best way to say it. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> it's pretty any, funny. Any one of those things is amazing. You could combine them going from the big farm in Iowa, never having gone farther than Omaha, never being on a plane, to going to the fourth time in a plane, jumping out of it, going into the water in, in a very big way, getting through buds on the first try. That's outstanding. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, I mean, I was, uh, 
from a fitness aspect, you know, I was in good shape. Mm -hmm. I was young. Um, I would also say I was lucky. Uh, a lot of people get hurt, you know, people better than me end up getting hurt and don't make it through training. Mm -hmm. There's always some level of luck. Uh, and you know, I was just too stupid to quit. Uh, most people that, most people that don't make it through training, uh, mm -hmm. it's because they quit. I mean, of course there's, there's always a few that get injured just because of all the, you know, it's a lot of volume running mm -hmm. and all that a lot of overuse. Um, but I made it through, you know, fortunately, and I never, I was one of two people in my class. Um, I think we started with 190 and graduated with like 22 and uh, like eight, 19 of those were from that original 190, right? So wow. about 10% of us made it through. And I was, I was one of two or three dudes who never failed a thing in butts. Not not a run, a swim, a dot, never one thing. And uh, that was probably my best skill. I was never like, I wasn't the fastest runner and I wasn't the fastest swimmer. Um, mm -hmm. I could not, I could not do the most pull-ups. You know, there were some beasts. Uh, I could not do the most push-ups and, you know, or sit-ups or whatever. Like, yeah. uh, but I could just kind of, kind of pretty, you know, top five, top 10 at all of those which made it, uh, you know, made it easier. Um, yeah. some of the, some of the really good swimmers might like, for example, not be great at running or pull-ups or some of the really good runners might not swim well or whatever. And I never, I was never best at any one of those. So kind of a generalist. Well, this paid off. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Just generalism, like being really good at most things serves you yeah. better than being a master at a few. And right. Yeah. I'm never, you know, I'm never going to win some championship, but, uh, or, you know, or a title, but, sure. uh, you know, I can do a lot of different stuff. So <laughs> very well too. A right. Lot of different, very impressive life skills. Yeah. Um, well, so growing up, did you do a lot of hunting? I, I know, you know, this is your thing. Like, uh, yeah. I just met you bow hunting. We talked a lot about that and that was, that was new to me. Um, right. But, it always, it always fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I tried to do as much hunting as possible. Uh, a little bit of bow hunting with my, uh, you know, for deer. Mm -hmm. And then obviously a bunch of small game hunting, pheasant and rabbit and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my fondest memories is just hunting pheasants and rabbits with my, uh, my grandpa, you know, whenever we'd go visit. Uh, but, for the most part, I was too busy on the farm to really go hunting that much. Yeah. Um, you know, I played football in the fall and, uh, that was, that was about it. Um, I didn't really get, and I didn't hunt much when I was, you know, in the Navy beyond doing deployments and chasing bad guys. Um, that's a form of, hunting, I, I would think, I suppose that's a form of hunting, yeah. but, uh, you know, when I got out of the, uh, when I got out of the Navy, um, it's like one or two years after getting out, I kind of came across the whole, the concept of backcountry um, hunting where you're yeah. self-supported for three to three to five to 10 to 14 days. And you have all of your, you know, your world in a backpack Yeah, and you're hiking and you're hunting and you're camping and you're kind of you know, self-sustained, like for me that, like that filled a void, uh, sort of, you know, left behind when I, when I, or, you know, a void that was in me from leaving the military from, uh, from a fitness perspective, mm -hmm. from just the sheer volume of gear. Like I yes. love the gear. I love the procurement of gear. <laughs> um, I love planning, you know, breaking out a map and doing some land nav and syncing my GPS and using a compass. Like it's, to me, it's one of the funnest things you can do is traipse around the woods, uh, chasing an animal, trying to navigate with map and compass, uh, eating dehydrated meals, sleeping under the stars and purifying your water. Like, uh, Sold. it's just, <laughs> it's just like, it, it's so much fun and it just resets your, you know, a week plus of purifying water 
Mm -hmm. makes you have such an appreciation for a water faucet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or a, you know, a, you know, a week of sleeping on a little therma rest mattress, like makes, you know, makes your Casper mattress seem like, you know, five star. So absolutely. Um, I feel just you stuff on that, like that. Yeah. And, and, and like the biggest thing, like the food, like you can come down after a week in the mountain and you know, you can go to Red Robin and it's going to like you don't <laughs> like you yeah, totally reset your entire baseline. So it's great. Oh, that's a very good point. And I think a lot of our listeners and viewers can all relate to that because like the very first time we met, we met and we talked about gear for a long time. Right. We were talking about water purifiers, water filters. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was it was such a pleasure. And to know that you were like you and your guys were out there testing these things in crazier conditions than the, what I and my friends do. But still, backcountry traveling, backcountry hiking, camping, backcountry skiing, backcountry splitboarding, just being right. out there, right? And just being self-sufficient and being not necessarily off the map or off comms, but just being present. Yeah. And do come right. back. Like you said, the French fries are taste better. Everything's better. Everything's <laughs> better. Yeah. And it's I went, I went a couple of years ago where it was like, it was like three in the afternoon. And this is the, one of the best parts, you know, we live and die by our calendars mm -hmm. and our busy, busy schedules. And I don't know, it was like three or four years ago. I forget, but it was two or three in the afternoon. And like, I had finally looked at my watch and I was like, it's my birthday. Like, <laughs> I, like my birthday had almost passed and I didn't even register. And just so, uh, you know, there's an unplugging aspect as well. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. So, well, yeah. Well, I, I don't know about you, but um, I, I spend probably three days a week on average camping and in the mountains. In the last two months, obviously, we're going through a situation where we're not allowed to go up there. And like, like we're talking about giving things up makes you appreciate them more. For a lot yeah, of right. Um, so I believe if I read everything correctly, we are allowed to go camping. So I'm already packed. I'm ready to go. I'm gonna you're, go bol you're bolting this weekend. Oh, I'm going. I'm going tomorrow. I would have gone today. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. It's this conversation. But yeah, I, I can't imagine how rewarding it's going to be to just be up there and just no cell phone, just sit in the snow or the dirt, wherever we go and let the dogs run around and just yeah. soak, it up. soak it up. It's so great. Um, I don't have... You know, I can't just up and leave today, uh, mm -hmm. but I'll definitely be camping soon. Uh, we're, I think we're in the final week of, uh, so I have four kids. The youngest is eight and the oldest is uh, 14. And we're in the final week of uh, <laughs> homeschooling. So wow. we got we to gotta finish strong and, you know, help them, uh, you know, make sure they get all their work done. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, it's a whole it, new, it's, it's a challenge getting a second grader to connect on a Zoom call, let me tell you. I, I don't know how people do it. <laughs> my friends it's, are hard enough, it's hard enough for us. Right. <laughs> it is. Um, that's very true. You know, I, I really enjoyed watching all my friends who are parents adapt and become, you know, their, right. their kids' assistants, basically. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, I was talking with a couple of fathers this morning about, hey, we're going to bug out in about two weeks. Let's get a big old convoy that's and cool. go head out. And, yeah, and a lot of them do teardrop trailers. I have a rooftop tent. I, of course, I have like nine tents to test for Mountain Hardware or North Face, and so I've got a, a plethora of gear. If you and your family need anything, I need to test. I need to test some tents, so uh, we'll connect. But, uh, yeah, got you covered. We'll, con we'll connect on that one uh, offline. I definitely. I mean, even in the backyard, I, I would test a tent. So I tested. It's beautiful tent. right now. Yeah, it's gorgeous right now. Um, the last snowstorm we had, I was testing out some tents on our deck. Like we live in a condo, mm -hmm. right? So we have tents on our deck, and neighbors are walking by. Usually, I saw those. Surfing. I saw those photos. <laughs> yeah. That was a good time using kettlebells as tent stakes. It worked totally. Out. Yeah. Oh, by any means necessary. But yeah, got you. Totally. Covered. Oh, how fun! Well. I'm sure that you guys in the SEALs, you, were you in the dev group? Is that correct? Uh, I spent some time at a uh, little bit of time at Team 5, and then uh, the most I spent at any one place, uh, yeah, would have been dev group. So I didn't know that. Uh, Jeff Sokol told me that last talk. 
Yeah. And let, I, you know, I don't talk much about what, yeah. you know, what I sort of did there. Um, there was some, I don't know. There was a bunch of NDAs involved. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what, I actually don't even know what the heck I can talk about. So. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. I, it was, it was, but cool. it was, uh, it was cool. I bet it was. And that's why I was going with it. It was like when I, when I was talking with Jeff um, about a month and a half ago, we're talking about fitness and how his gym is adapting to everything and, and vice versa. And I mentioned your name and he lit up with just so much respect and admiration. He's like, Oh, he, Eric Frohart, tip of the spear, you know, like he's great. He's a great guy. Very kind, very big heart. Yeah. And I love, I really enjoy watching his, uh, you know, his, his posts and uh, his, yeah, his, so not just his programs, but then his, you know, kind of, his kind of attitude towards stuff. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm glad to hear you say that too. It's comical. It's inspiring. It's relatable. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all of the above. Yeah. Uh, not, not to mention he's pretty damn fit himself. And so, <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> you, you know, that's another thing too. Like, um, because of you, I've been allowed to meet so many wonderful men and women from Strong First. Um, it's just been an honor to the people that we get to work with and associate with, and I consider mentors right. are just some of the best people in the world. Like, strong in heart, strong in physical, and just strong right. in everything. It's really amazing. Um, how did you come across and how did you get involved with Pavel in the first place? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a funny story. So I, uh, I was like everyone doing kind of, if you remember like the late nineties, early two thousands, really even before that, um, you do kind of a bodybuilder style workout. Oh yeah. Where I by those and I, and I broke myself by those. Yeah. You have like, chest and tries back and buys <laughs> yeah you know, a, a cardio day or whatever yeah and uh granted i had you know mixed that with some you know running and swimming and calisthenics due to my you know the requirement to always be able to pass the you know the seal uh prt or physical readiness test mm -hmm. so i did a bunch of that and then i don't i forget when but all of a sudden people were like doing crossfit in a gym and you know, I was very fascinated by the idea, um, you know, without any practice or instruction, you know, I'm trying to do snatch and clean and jerk and stuff like that. Right. Um, didn't go well. and then, yeah, I didn't go well. And I, all of a sudden I like saw a buddy of mine in a gym by this time I had left team five, I'd gone to the East coast. Uh, I was at dev grew and I saw a friend of mine doing like these strange exercises uh, which we have come to know as swings yeah. uh, and snatches. He was doing them in a quarter in the corner of the gym, you know, with the, you know, the cannonball with the handle on it. And uh, those guys. I was like, John, John, you're going to hurt yourself. What the hell is that? Yeah. And, you know, he kind of explained to me, you know, it's, it's a strength move. It's a conditioning move. It's all the, you know, it's all of the above. So, mm -hmm. you know, at that time we had, you know, internet. So I spent the rest of that night and a couple more nights just going through forums and the old, it was the Dragon Door website back oh, yeah. then. It still is, but uh, Pavel was at Dragon Door and I just kind of was so fascinated. So I ordered, ordered my kettlebell. Uh, I ordered the Russian kettlebell challenge book mm -hmm. um, and I was on my way. <laughs> um, I did, I brought that, that kettlebell, two kettlebells on deployment with me um, and uh, went through the program and really enjoyed it and felt, you know, strong and fit. And I could just, I felt more connected mm -hmm. and I could do my cardio and my strength, you know, training in one move. Uh, and I, you know, just felt like I moved better with body armor and I just, you know, could last longer and, Mm -hmm. You know, there, cause there were deployments where I got really big and really strong, but my, you know, I ran out of gas Yeah. and then there were deployments where I focused more on cardio and aerobic capacity, but then I wasn't strong enough to carry my body armor all day. So, uh, I was always, you know, I could never do them both well. And the kettlebell, uh, allowed me to do both of them well. 
uh, the strength and the conditioning. And there's way, there are ways to get in better cardio shape and there are ways to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's, but all of those ways are more complicated and take more equipment. So I just was really drawn to the fact that two or three days a week, all I needed was one or two kettlebells and I was good to go prepared for, you know, the rigors of a seal deployment. So saying a lot. If, if it worked for that, it should yeah. work for most, uh, you know, most things. So I used the kettlebell to prepare me for deployments. Um, I, it really helped me when I did uh, my climbs. Um, mm -hmm. Just be, you know, obviously I spent a lot of time under load mm -hmm. and a lot of time walking. So I don't discount, don't, I don't discount how much that prepared me for, you know, 10 to 20 day mountaineering trips. Mm -hmm. um, but the kettlebell just gave me overall strength and conditioning and, and health and things like that. So anyway, I was a big believer in it. And uh, towards the end of my career, I was like, you know, I might as well go get certified as a kettlebell instructor. I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So I did that in Minneapolis. And I think it was, oh, I want to say it was oh nine. Um, so I did that. And that was as an RKC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, I don't know when, but Pavel left and founded strong first. And he was doing that for a while. And I was doing my thing at the time I was running a, my buddy and I had, uh, started a gun range here in Denver. So I was doing that. And then, uh, Pavel reached out to me and, uh, he said, Hey, I'm looking for a new, uh, CEO. Um, and that was for strong first. And, uh, he wanted me to help him, you know, find someone, right. Cause he thought I was kind of too busy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after taking one of my daily walks, like the, uh, you know, the, I, the idea just, you know, that light bulb went off and I was like, Pavel, what about me? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, after a pretty lengthy interview process, uh, you know, he gave me the job and uh super cool um and That's super cool and that guy who introduced us is a guy named john Foz, and he grew up in minneapolis um he was you know one of my best friends uh in the navy and he grew up in minneapolis and knew pavel from a from a very young age mm -hmm. and um he you know he connected me with pavel because you know i loved the kettlebell and his system and mm -hmm. then um you know, John, John's one of my teammates who died in the helicopter crash back in uh, August of 2011. So anyway, awesome. it kind of all connected through John. And then, uh, you know, you just never know how things are going to work out. No. Well, you know, it's kind of funny when um, our mutual friend, Karen, who I was training with kettlebells, said, you know, you would like my friend, Eric. He likes to go outside a lot. He likes kettlebells and he likes gear. I'll give you yeah. this. So I blindly email you, right? And I would go to meet and get coffee, not knowing you're the CEO of Strong First. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And, and so obviously like, you know, you're in all the books and you have all the articles and um, you ran it, the company so well. There's a nice shout out to you in the book, obviously. So <laughs> yeah, so cool. Great. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think I, I wasn't in all the books. I was in that one for sure. But oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you were. I have, I have all the books. But, yeah, uh, and well, thanks yeah. to you, I have uh, all the education from Strong First. <laughs> right. I mean, right. it's been so fun to pick your brain. Like, this one's a lot of fun. The Mountain Strong one, yeah, is bizarre. But um, the Strong Endurance one, that's the one I think that I am most in love with and still use. And I you probably do too. Right. I use it a lot. Yeah, it's just in the O33C before this call. It's it just still works. It's just yeah. simple. You know, you push and you swing. But um, it's a it's a very good uh, minimum effective dose strength conditioning mm -hmm. uh, program. It's a, it's one of those programs like there's ways to get in better shape mm -hmm. and there's ways to get stronger and, you know, more fit or whatever. But, you know, that is the amount of value you can get out of those short sessions is phenomenal. Oh, it is. And, you know, you were so helpful when I was doing the 033, you were doing it. Our friend, Matthew Flaherty, who I'm going to have a, a podcast with tonight out in New York city, him and his wife. Yeah. Such a good yeah, guy. I remember Matthew. Oh, he's, he's a character. I love that guy. So in this, book, yeah. 
if this is open to any civilian, any person who wants to purchase it, I would recommend it. And that program that Eric and I are talking about is the primary part of the book. And there is page 43, there's Eric right there. My name's in there too, which is really cool. There's Matthew's name right there. Yeah. And then here in the audio book of Pavel saying our names out, I was like, I want to make that my ringtone on my phone. It's so cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is cool. Uh, yeah, and that's been a good program for me, um, 033, as a um, incorporating in his, you know, it's his book, Quick and the Dead, and mm -hmm. incorporating that uh, 033C um, mm -hmm. into my kind of, uh, when I switch over to pre-hunt, programming um doing that two or three times a week along with two you know two hikes a week uh it's a great way to get prepared to carry some load that makes sense and you know like you i use it two or three times a week as well and i spend probably two or three days a week not hiking but backcountry split boarding so basically mm -hmm. ascending a mountain you know like you do with the skis and um that's my training that's my training as much as possible until yeah then it's hiking and, and backpacking although i'm not carrying out as much weight as you're carrying out well i don't always you know that's always um kind of my ramp up i build mm -hmm. up you know to the 50 pound uh an elk quarter can weigh more you know 80 pounds or more right. so it's kind of a when you have to carry an elk quarter you know three to four miles to your car um you know up and down you know the mountain or over deadfall trees or whatever right. like not your normal um, trail well put it this way going out and doing runs will not prepare you to do that <laughs> so anyway so for people who do uh want to get into uh bow hunting would you recommend adding in a day or two of rucking or um for their fitness yeah um, you know, strength training is obviously paramount. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is, uh, you know, the, the most, the closest you can come to mimicking the, you know, the event, the better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, there's no amount of kettlebell swings that will prepare you for, you know, 12 hours of hiking. Um, Good your 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 legs and your lungs might be strong and uh your core will be strong and you know your midsection will be strong but you've neglected the you know to train your feet or yes. <laughs> to train you know having load on your shoulders or tweaking your hip belt you know all that kind of thing yes. um if you don't uh if you don't do that uh you know it can be <laughs> You can find out the hard way. Yeah, put it that way. You're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> yeah, a couple miles away from your car. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. I, I've been fortunate to train a few bow hunters, and they they know of you, and they're they're gonna love this episode. And um, they bring in their kits, and like they're they're really awesome backpacks. Like my backpacks are made for like 35, 50 pounds of of backpacking, right? Your guys, right. if you're gonna go in with like twenty or thirty pounds, you're gonna come out with eighty more pounds, right? On a good day, right? So it's a different it's a different scenario more rugged like mystery ranch and all these other really cool companies um it's just miss cool. yeah mystery ranch is they're great to work with it's, they have great packs i have mystery ranch stone glacier uh, i do i have mostly now i have uh, this company sika gear oh, yeah. great awesome awesome stuff um really enjoy their you know their gear and it's like you said you you know it's good to have a light backpack but you want to make sure that that backpack can still handle 100 pound loads when you know when the time comes so exactly and optics too i see you got the costa del mar sunglasses we're big fans of Costa. well no these are the oh oakley's gotcha yeah yeah i've had you know oakley's or smith i don't you know. yeah you're a smith guy i thought yeah well I, i'll get you a pair of i like them i like them both i don't really yeah you know, good optics. i got yeah yeah I think when you said optics, I thought you were talking about binoculars. So oh, that's something I don't know enough about. And, and spotting scopes. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you call that? Yeah. It's like glassing when you're when you're uh, getting visual on something. Yeah, yeah. That's Which cool. you know, that's a great way to you know. One, I forget the expression, but it's like uh, you know, cover the terrain with your eyes before you cover it with your legs, right? That's wise so, for a lot of people. <laughs> well, it cuts down on the miles. Uh, sure does. Well, 
I'm going to pick your brain on this. So say you're a bad yeah. um, skier or hiker or hunter and you're out and things aren't going according to plan, which they probably usually don't. But what is your like, go-to methodology of like gathering your wits of, of like keeping calm? Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. If, I can't, I can't, I don't know if this is true. I hear it. I hear it all the time, especially in like land nav circles, like land navigation training. Um, humans are the only animals that move faster when they're lost. <laughs> so when we're lost, we kind of get frantic and we move, you know, one direction or all directions very quickly versus, you know, stopping and uh, calming down and mm -hmm. just figuring it out. And, uh, you know, most people get into situations, um, uh, because they're, you know, they haven't been exposed to them enough and then, you know, they haven't been exposed enough and then they lose their composure. Right. Um, and then, you know, it just kind of snowballs, um, from being lost to, which is a, you know, that's a common one. Lots of, oh, sure. Uh, Lots of people get lost uh, and they, you know, I've been lost before. Everyone, if you spend enough time in the back country, you know, you're going to get lost, yeah. especially, especially if you're like, you know, trying to navigate at night in thick, you know, thick timber and your GPS isn't working and you just, it's so easy to get, just get lost. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the most common ones or uh I would say late summer, early fall, uh, lightning strikes. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know if they're common, but you know, you're up there and you know, it having been up there. Um, there've been plenty of times when I'm above tree line and I hear the thunder and maybe some rain or some hail comes and yeah. It's scurry. You know, the, ideally you would, uh, you know, start, you know, start losing some altitude before your hair started standing up from the <laughs> yeah. static well. electricity. <laughs> um, so just knowing, you know, recognizing like, okay, this is a probable lightning strike situation. I'm mm -hmm. carrying either a bow or a rifle. Yeah. Um, I'm above tree line, you mm -hmm. know, above 10,000, 11,000 feet. Mm -hmm. This is all the, this is all the signs of uh, a lightning strike. It is time for me to bleed some altitude. So just, uh, it's the easiest thing to escape. Just start walking downhill. Right. Yeah. Like, so there's that one. Um, obviously a common one I would say is, uh, you know, they, it, it's known more in the winter, but it can happen in the summer here in Colorado. And certainly in late fall is hypothermia. Mm -hmm. um, just not having, uh, not having the gear uh, or the right gear or airing, you know, airing too much on the side of staying really light. Yep. Um, you know, that's a great way to get hypothermia, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, the, you know, I, the, um, having experience can help you deal with those things. And until you get experience, you know, you have to carry more gear. Yeah. Right. I, I carry a lot of gear because I'm so used to going out with people and I enjoy this. I like gear a lot, but I, I'm so used to going out with people who under prepare and like you yeah. said, hope for the best that I'm just so sick of having to be the hero. That I just carry more gear. Like just, I, I've kind of, I used to, you know, I kind of pride myself now. I want to be able to do five to seven days of hunting with a, my fully loaded pack to weigh 35 or less pounds. Wow. So I'm really trimming the fat. Yes, um, you are. Are you using the tarp or are you uh you know, I'll I'll use sometimes a tarp or an ultralight tent. Mm -hmm. Uh very obviously this is fall hunting, not not late fall. This is like September, you know, hunting. Um and you know, I'm not that comfortable and I don't I barely have enough food. But right. <laughs> uh I'm not out there I'm not out there for, you know, to I'm not out there for that. I'm out there for something else. So, yeah. uh, but that's a fine line. It's very easy to, it's very easy. It's very easy to carry too little and be very miserable. And mm -hmm. if you get too miserable, it's going to affect the number of days you can spend on the mountain. Right. Oh, yeah. And 
what about repair kit like and first aid kit like wh what are your essentials that you always keep with you so uh gear wise uh you know i'll have obviously um i kind of separated into three categories right the clothes the, the what i'm wearing on me right now mm -hmm. um you know which is your your base layer uh, your pants, your shirts, that sort of thing. Um, socks and boots. Um, boots being very critical, obviously. And then, uh, then it's the equipment I carry, which would be, you know, in the military, you call it your second line gear. And that would be my uh, binocular harness, which has my binoculars, uh, maybe my handgun, um, my calls. Uh, my GPS, my compass, mm -hmm. uh, calls, my elk, animal calls, yeah, elk calls. Yep. Uh, and then, uh, so that's kind of the gear that I'm carrying. Uh, obviously my, if it's archery, my bow and my arrows and my, you know, all that gear. And then uh, third line is everything I put in my pack. And uh, that is obviously that's very dependent on the, uh, you know, where you're going and mm -hmm. the time of year and the duration, but you're always going to have, uh, some sort of, a, you know, shelter and sleep system, um, a tent or a tarp, uh, um, a thermo rest or, you know, a ground pad and a sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. And then you're always going to have a, so, that's your shelter, your sleep system. Then you're going to have uh, food and water. So some kind of a way to collect water and filter it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously a stove and some dehydrated food. Uh, I like to add plenty of, like I have these little Nalgene bottles with like one's MCT oil, one's yeah. like olive oil, one's whatever. Love and then... You know, perhaps most importantly, uh, you know, your coffee. So yeah, the coffee. That was like gear of the year for a reason. Yes. So you got your, you know, whatever kind of coffee, you know, you have. And then, uh, um, and then you have different warming layers, um, you know, maybe a mid layer, maybe a puffy coat, obviously, you know, some rain gear, mm -hmm. extra socks, maybe, uh, you know, some stuff like that. Um, a kill kit, which is, oh, yeah. yeah. So like game, game bags, uh, your, you know, your knife, uh, your skinning knife and just something to, you know, quarter out the, you know, the elk or the animal, uh, maybe some 550 cord to hang it from a tree, keep it out of the, you know, reach of a bear and, uh, stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, some first aid stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then just some, I always have like an emergency kit, like extra ways to start fire for signaling, you know, for um, emergency shelter, things like that. Um, and maybe an, a spare ration. Um, for the most part, I don't get too old school survival mm -hmm. in, you know, I want to have three or four ways to start a fire. I'm not going to, hang out out there and make a bow drill. Um, like if it gets that bad, I'm walking to my car. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I don't bear grill style. Yeah. I don't really need to do that. Um, uh, it's not, so I'm not like a primitive skills survival guy. I'm more of a carry four or five ways to make a fire guy. I like that a lot. I can respect that. <laughs> yeah. So, that's that's super helpful. Yeah, I just lost similarities. Obviously, not being a hunter myself, the the calls and the kill kit, and uh, I do carry paracord for sure. Actually, right. um, a different kind of cord these days, spectra, spectra cord. Yeah, no, I I would carry that. I you know I still have yards and yards of paracord. I so. bet. <laughs> I bet you do. Oh, that's really wonderful stuff. It's so fun talking about gear with you too because. I, I'm so like in my own world of like people who hike and stuff, but it's so fun to talk with people who are going, doing that, right. and then the next level. And I, it's fun picking the brains of especially bow hunters because from what it sounds like, 
the odds are not in your favor. I mean, 8% no. success rate, give or take, is that sound about accurate? Yeah, it depends. I know it's under 10%, um, depending, you know, if it's uh, Colorado, um, Colorado public land, um, over the counter draw, mm -hmm. meaning uh, it's not a preferred, you know, game management unit, and you're doing it on public land. Depending on the unit you're in, it's you know it's definitely well below ten percent. So uh, it's kind of the you know it's kind of that's that's the appeal too. Um, right. Yeah. So you don't want it to be easy. Um, I know. Um, one of my guys I trained, he was successful on on two of his of his trips, and so he brought back um, quite a bit of elk. So I've got a little deep freezer we got from Costco, and I've got a section of yeah. elk. So excited about it. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's great. It's the best. Uh, it's my, one of my favorite, like big game, wild game meats mm -hmm. for sure. It's the, it's very close to beef. Yes. I would say just slightly, uh, you gotta be careful. Just don't overdo it when, uh, it gets a like wild game gets a bad name because people kind of overdo it. And if you, if you don't overdo it, uh, you know, it can taste great. That's a very good point. Actually, I went and got a meat thermometer. I was like, I could cook yeah. fine. I can do all my steaks by hand. No, I made the mistake of overdoing a tenderloin and ruining it. And no, you, you got to cook a rare. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, medium rare on elk is like you're starting to get pretty overdone. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. <laughs> and then also, I, I think he, at least his butcher, had mixed in some pork for some uh, sausages. Typically on the ground elk. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll mix in, mix in some sort of, uh, butchers call it suet, uh, oh. but it's uh, some kind of fat, uh, either pork or beef uh, or a combo. Um, but yeah, it, it does, otherwise it just doesn't stick together in a burger. It makes right? it it's yeah. so lean, right? It's, yeah, it's just so lean, which, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a nice appeal to it. And then, like you said, like the actual hunt, like the, the low success rate, you know, and the challenge. Right. Um, very appealing. I've heard of people who would come to Colorado to bow hunt elk over going and doing some, in my opinion, crazier hunting, right? Because it's so much more challenging. Well, I mean, it's, it's bow hunting on public land is pretty challenging everywhere. Um, you know, other states might have better success rates, but Colorado just has more options. So it's one of the, you know, it has the largest elk population mm -hmm. and it has the most public, public, uh, you know, over the county hunting, uh, over the counter hunting opportunities. Okay. Uh, and in spite of all that, it's still, you know, elk populations are, you know, they're, they're still down. Um, and, uh, you know, sidebar, I really hope they don't, you know, introduce wolves out there because they'll make it 10 times worse. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. I was talking with some other friends. Um, it's a very common topic right now, heated topic about bringing wolves into what Rocky Mountain National Park or what have you to try and, yeah, think, why would they just let you guys go in for like a long weekend and fill your freezers? And I, I don't know. It's, you know, it's kind of, you know, I understand wolves were here or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, as my understanding goes, they're bringing in a different species, number mm -hmm. one, than existed here previously. And the times are different. You know, we now live in a world where, you know, there's so many people and there's so many elk and, you know, we come in closer and closer contact and it affects populations. And all you got to do is look at states that introduced uh, wolves. Uh, they're just, they're not just hunters uh, to eat. You know, they, they kill for sport right yeah. they are pure you know they are real hunters uh and they will you know states like montana have just decimated areas you can go out for a week and not see an elk um Weird. parts of wyoming parts of idaho um i've just you know i've just heard too many horror stories from hunters who know um and they understand uh, they understand the problem and uh you know colorado has prohibited its you know department of uh, Parks and Wildlife, uh, or its Department of Natural Resources, I forget what they call it here, but they've prohibited their people from talking about it, which is complete, you know, nonsense. And now, you know, we have a system here, as you know, where 
you can put things on a ballot measure and if it gets enough votes, then everyone gets to vote on it. And, you know, people don't, uh, you know, most of the people who are going to cast this vote live in downtown Denver <laughs> and yeah, they have no understanding of the, you know, they have no understanding of what they're about to do. Wolves will, you know, they're hard to, you know, they're hard to kill. They'll overpopulate and pretty soon they'll just, if you enjoy seeing elk and deer and sheep and stuff like that, uh, you know, don't cast a vote to allow you know, someone from California or New York to come plant a bunch of wolves into our forest. That's well said. I'll get off my pedestal. No, no, no. I love your take on this because I I respect it as much as anybody. Um, you know what you're doing, and it's, it's I'm glad to hear your take is is in line with what I've read and what I've what I believe too. So yeah. that that cool. makes me feel a lot better about that. And um, well, let's talk about what are you up to currently. So I saw that Defy Sure. What's what's this all about? Yeah, I am helping. Um, I'm helping this company. It's a very cool uh, Colorado company founded uh, by a friend of mine, uh, and along with uh, uh, TD Terrell Davis, uh, Broncos oh, yeah. legend. And uh, it's a uh, they have a few different CBD products: uh, a balm, a tincture, and most notably a a sports drink. And uh, it's uh, they're all zero THC. Uh, it's very high quality um, CBD. Uh, I forget some of the science stuff behind it. That's not, you know, what I do with them. But uh, it's uh, it's helped, you know, it helped TD with his knee pain, uh, and then it's uh, helped others. It's helped my daughter very recently overcome some migraines. So wow, I I believe in that. And uh, I lost a kidney in the military, so um, I'm not allowed to take any like pain meds. And uh, I train pretty hard and yeah. uh, I have some inflammation. So it's helped me as well. Um, and anyway, I help them. Uh, yeah, um, I'm helping them with their uh, kind of a campaign to give back. And uh, most notably or specifically, uh, they're very uh, interested in giving back to the community and uh, helping uh, military and first responders. So with my background in the military, that's kind of what I'm kind of helping with uh, when I can. That's awesome, Eric. That's really cool. Yeah. I know a lot of our fitness friends, um, in the last few years, um, are getting on the CBD and, and for good reasons, like you, you said, inflammation, I have arthritis yeah. in both my feet and, um, sure yeah. it would be nice to have some relief from that inflammation for sure. Well, check out there, you know, they have the tincture, which you put under your, under your tongue, which, uh, for me, like some nights I fall asleep really well and some nights my mind starts racing. So get that that has helped me kind of calm down specifically at night um and then after my workouts you know i was drinking one earlier i have a a defy uh, it's a cbd infused drink so they have one of the first or the first um um bioavailable uh drinks of cbd so they're molecules yeah, because mostly you have to put it under your lip or yeah. rub it on as a balm. But their science, they've figured out, and I should be more educated on this. I, I will. Uh, but they're, you, they've engineered some sort of formula where you can actually get the benefits of CBD by drinking it. So That's great. I know a lot of uh, supplements you know, that are great are not very bioavailable. So right. that's like the magic is how you get the body to actually absorb and utilize those nutrients effectively. So. Right. Well, that's yeah, awesome. So, Check that out. And I'm super excited to, you know, they had a great company, a uh, friend of mine and you know, some other folks there and obviously uh, TD and then my, uh, you know, hopefully I can help them you know, partner with some, do some military stuff. So uh, that's a win. Super cool. That's very yeah. cool. Uh, and Blue Core, so operating Blue Core? Uh, yep. Blue Core is still, uh, still trucking along. I've definitely stepped down from the day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, kind of a minority owner. Uh, don't really go out there much unless I want to go shoot. Uh, and I'll still, uh, you know, I'll still teach people from time to time, um, you know, how to shoot and uh, help them get their concealed carry permit or something like that. So, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and now I'm taking my son shooting a lot. So, it's, uh, it's a lot that's of fun. so cool. That's yeah. Cool. 
I know you've offered to, to teach me to shoot, and I will take up on the offer. I know if I'm going to learn from anybody, it's going to be from a Navy SEAL sniper. That's <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be great. It'll be great. Well, it's wonderful, Eric. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to cover? I always love bending your ear. Yeah. Um, so how many days did you get split boarding? Um, did you get it shut down? or oh, yeah. when, when did you shut it down? I shut it down. Um, I was reading a report. I think Tim Ferriss put it up the first week of March, and I was like, this could get really squirrely really quickly. Right. Um, and then, obviously, helping run the Backcountry Ski and Snowboard group, which um, we have like 8,600 members now in this Facebook group. It's a private wow. one. Yeah. So there's five admins of us total, and we're all doing our best to try and lead by example. I know it's, uh, some people are still going to the mountains, like today. Um, and those are my friends. They're having fun. They're being as safe as possible, trying not to do anything too crazy. But it is backcountry skiing. It's inherently dangerous. Um, I took a different approach. I tried to, you know, listen to the Mayor Hancock's recommendation of staying 10 miles from home. I haven't been more than 10 miles since March 14th or 15th. Right. So, you know, um, the things have changed a little bit. Like I said, um, I am packed up and ready to go tomorrow. So right. I'm excited about that. Um, so usually like March, April, May, and even some parts of June is like prime time for when I get up there three, four times a week. So this season, I probably only have, shouldn't I say only, probably 30 days as opposed to like 100. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think I got 15 days on, you know, just lift skiing. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I didn't get a lot of backcountry skiing, obviously, because that – for whatever reason, kind of do that later in the year, whatever. Yeah, um, it, it's safer later in the year too, you know, like. Is that what it is? Is it just the yeah. snow has kind of packed down? Yeah, a lot of the lines you do want to do in Vail, like I know you like the, the blacks and all the hooking yourself off of cliffs and stuff. And I wouldn't touch any of that until like right now because right. Uh, the snow has, it's definitely bonded and formed in its way safer. Yeah. And, I mean, I learned all this stuff in like the area level two which is just super nerdy snow science basically right just right. learning that snow is basically ball bearings and they're moving all around you want them to be cohesive predictable yeah. manageable so well, you know. <laughs> we'll have to go do that uh we'll have to do that next year i'll i'll hike up in skis i'll skin up in skis and you can split board but uh i'll look forward to that eric i know yeah i've scoped out some lines for you and i got some good ones picked out uh, i I, uh, and that was, you know, you, you touch a, a, a very interesting point on, um, it wasn't like, it wasn't that I was worried about getting the virus outside in the woods because it's easy to be six foot away from someone. Sure. I was more concerned with going big, getting hurt, and now going to a hospital that's already crowded and being mm -hmm. exposed, you know, being around people who are sick right mm -hmm. it's just uh you know i tried to mitigate the risk a little more yeah that's very wise of you especially with the family and i feel you i you know i didn't want to tax those communities I, I reached out to some friends who are nurses and doctors in summit county and i said what's the best practices to help you in your job in your safety and like don't come up just don't come up like, yeah right, and they got hit pretty hard they did uh, they were the first county, ones eagle county summit county just because of the you know, the global nature of those cities, yep. those areas. And um, I was talking to my doctor, tele teleconferencing with my doctor about two weeks ago. And I mentioned I got pretty sick in, in February. In, in February, outdoor retailer was the end of January. The day yeah. after that, 50,000 people from around the world. I was so sick at 105 degree temperature for two days. I like hallucinating. But yeah. like, like flu, but like really sick. I was like, doc, I had the, you know, dry cough. I, I like needles in my chest and all this stuff. And so I did my COVID test to get my results about an hour before this. Didn't have it. I was bummed. <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure I had it, but I didn't have I, it. Yeah. I had the same thing after shot show. Exactly. You were at a big show, a lot of people. And then, you, yeah. And I went in for a flu test because I was like, I went four days without eating. Yeah. I had this thing for five days. I, you know, I was just sick and shaking and i went in for a flu test they're like they said you have a virus but it is not a or b and at that time you know no one knew what covid was yet and i still haven't i still haven't gone in to get the antibody test of course i think i did 
And of course I probably didn't. Right. So, like most of us, like we, we, I'm, I'm glad we could talk about this because you're in a huge show, the shot show, which is like yeah. the outdoor retailer show is a shot show. So it's a lot of people and a lot of people yeah. in the convention center and a lot of, I don't know about you, but I'm always hugging people and like, yeah, popping beers and shaking hands and just right. all the wrong things at the current moment. I'll, but, I'll be interesting to see how, you know, uh, if it comes back next year, just that convention season that starts in January mm -hmm. and pushes through whenever, um, all the outdoor shows, the firearm shows, the hunting, sh all of those, mm -hmm. if they come back, like people are going to give fist bumps and walk around <laughs> with, walk around with Perel and oh, you yeah. know, all sorts of, I don't wear masks. I don't know. It'll be, it's a weird, it, things are definitely different. They are. I know they, they canceled outdoor retailer for the summer. I mean, that makes sense. But right. in, their, in, the, in its place, and this is really cool technology. Um, Mountain Hardware showed us this at the, the two shows ago using augmented reality to demonstrate uh -huh. the catalog of stuff. So uh, for a colleague of mine sent me over um, a link cool. to uh, do an outdoor show, like with Patagonia and all his companies, virtually. So then, yeah, so a person can still have a booth and allow people like media, like myself, and our Send me team. that. Send me that link. Uh, I, I will. I think you get a kick out of it. It's yeah, an amazing way to adapt to the situation. A, a friend of mine is the kind of the big game category manager at Sitka, so oh, I'll forward yeah. that to him. Maybe he could. Maybe they have a way to use that. It, they probably already do use it, but that's they don't yet. It could help them out in a big way. Yeah, um, and so now I am training uh, for. I'm, this Murph Murph challenge on yes. Memorial Day. So that's Me about too. it. Wow. It's always funny. Like the last question you asked me about, Sean, what are you training for? And I didn't have yeah. a very good answer. I was like, for life? Like, <laughs> no, no. Is there anything in particular now that the, you know, now that you're not working the legs and the lungs for, you know, earning your turn? Right. You know, that was my favorite kind of exercise besides the swings and snatches and push ups was just doing it, right? Yeah. So, um, what I'm training for is to get back to being able to do that and take my dogs on some big hikes, go backpacking. Yeah. That's, that's about it. Quality of life. That's what I'm training for. Right. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure. Uh, you're a yeah, great right. friend. You're a great asset. Um, you're, you're a, a national treasure, man. I, I appreciate you. Uh, well, I think that that's quite an over-exaggeration, but I appreciate it. Uh, you're a great friend too. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity and, Get up there on the mountains and stay safe, bro. You got it. Take care.